This is the Commission Church Online. Welcome to our podcast. We want to be a church who brings heaven on earth through the word of God and the love of Christ. I pray this week's message blesses you. Uh, I want to I jump into the scripture right now. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, the first letter to the, to the, the church in Thessalonica, uh, we've been studying this uh, book for the last four weeks, I want to say. Uh, you know, here at Commission, uh, the way we study the Word is we do an expository style of studying the Word, uh, which means we sometimes we take books or we take concepts and we break it down verse by verse and we explore passages and we, we in, encourage the body of believers and we teach the body of believers through the expounding of the Word of God. We have been in a series that we titled uh, Upside Down. And the reason we title it Upside Down is simply because of the verse in Acts 17 where Paul and Silas and Timothy have just visited Thessalonica. They have finished their missionary journey in Corinth and in Philippi and they're making their way to Thessalonica. People have heard about what has happened in Philippi. They have heard about the exploits that were done. They they heard about the baptisms and the souls that were saved. They heard about things, the miracles and the healings and the church beginning to grow. And word has spread so fast to Thessalonica. And the moment Paul, Silas, and Timothy walk in, they make a statement and they say, these same guys that caused an uproar and the words they used was the same guys that turned the world upside down, right, is, have come here to turn our world upside down. Now, the, the fact that the people in Thessalonica knew that there were things that they were doing that were contrary to the kingdom of God. Uh, there was so much of idolatry. There was so much of worshiping of other gods. There was so much of distancing, uh, distance that happened between man and God. And they knew that the, the power of the gospel was disrupting the, uh, the agenda of the enemy in that area. And, they, and red flags started flying and they said, man, these guys are going to turn the world that we know upside down. And through this series... We're trying to understand through Paul and through these apostles that walked into Thessalonica, that just finished their journey in Philippi, what they were doing or what God had put on their heart in order for them to turn the world upside down. And in turn, I pray that God will give us the passion in our hearts to understand and know how we can take a world that is upside down and turn it right side up. And the only way that can happen is when you and I live our lives right side up in this upside down world. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we finish 1 Thessalonians 1. And as we get into chapter number 2, we're going to cover, I hope, nine verses today. So bear with me as we go through this. We take our time to study the word here. So uh, verse number 1, I'm going to read the passage in its entirety. And uh, if... They have the, the, the words up there. You probably can follow up there, but uh, feel free to open your Bibles, open your iPhones, your Android devices. God bless you if you have one. But, you know, let's, let's open whatever we have, uh, the Bible app, and let's follow along as I read this passage. First Thessalonians, chapter number two. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether you or from others, though we could have, uh, though we could have made demands as apostles of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also to ourselves because you had become very dear to us. 
You know, on the outset, I want to take a few seconds to just point out something that just comes out to us, just, just pops out to us, something very interesting. Three times in the first few verses, Paul is saying, you know, you know, you know, as kind of a reminder. Haven't you heard that? Uh, people around you will remind you of different things to the point where some people can even sound nagging around you, right? Uh, haven't you always had that one person that would always come up to you and say, I told you so, right? That we, we always, some, some of you are looking at your spouses, yeah? Uh, it's, it's very common, right? That we hate that when someone says, I told you so, because it makes you look like, man, you didn't listen the first time or uh, you failed at something. But three times in a row, he actually repeats himself over and over again and says, you know, he's reminding them of sorts. It's kind of a repetition, reminding them of things that they already know. He's saying, man, you already know this, but let me remind you. You already heard this from me, but let me tell you again. When I was with you, I told you about these things, but let me reiterate to you. You know, as much as reminders and someone keeping on you and saying, hey, you know, you know, you know, can sound nagging, uh, you know, bear with me for a minute because I want to propose that it can also be a stabilizing thing. What do I mean by that, right? In the midst of an anxious moment, it can be good. It, reminding aids in stabilizing. It's important for us to understand when, when someone reminds us something and, and comforts us and reassures us. Reminding can be considered as reassuring. And Paul, in this context, is reassuring them of the blessed hope that they have. Paul reminds them of their relationship and love, even though they were separated. Paul and the Thessalonians were ripped apart, right? And in, in a way that they did not expect at all. They were taken apart. They were given death threats. And Paul had to flee from Thessalonica after those three weeks as we know it. You know, sometimes when they're feeling destabilized, when we're feeling destabilized and fear and anxiety play on repeat in our minds, man, it leads us to, to think unsafe thoughts and irrational thoughts. It can bring negative thoughts and it can become paralyzing in our hearts. And Paul is calming them and reminding them what it was like when they, when, when they were with them, when Paul and Silas and Timothy was with them. He was comforting them and reminding them that, man, things were great. Things were amazing. The Holy Spirit was with us. Don't lose hope. Reminding can help you reset. Reminding can help you remember God's goodness. It's so important for us to remind each other of the goodness of God. We do that as a family, Sonia and I sometimes, when we go through hard times, when we go through uh, times of, 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 of hardship, it could be in, in our relationship, in our, in our family, we always remind ourselves of the goodness of God. If God did it yesterday, he can do it again. Because in the Bible, the Bible is very clear when it reminds us he is the same unchanging God yesterday, today, and forevermore. Every time, Lisa, I'm faced with an impossible situation, I always tend to remember, to remind myself, to go back in time and remember a situation that happened five years ago, ten years ago, when I almost thought that it was, that was it. My, my life was ending. My, my career was ending. My business was ending. I always look back to that point where God brought me out of there and rescued me and put me on a rock to stay. Paul reminds them of their relationship and their love, even though they are separated. You know, we remind everyone of what our calling and our mission is as a church, Sunday after Sunday. We remind ourselves of our vision to go out, to break the walls of our church. It's like children who go to school and they repeat the Pledge of Allegiance over and over and over again. It's to remind them of who they are, who, 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 the, 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 the citizenship that they have, the allegiance that they have, the country that they belong to. Haven't you been there when you love a song and, and you, you have it on repeat? It, it, it doesn't matter which time it was. It, it might have been you growing up. You might have been in 80s or a 70s or a, you know, 90s or 2000s kids. It doesn't matter. But you remember when there was a song that came out in your heyday and it was the song. It was stuck in your head. You would just sit, say it over and over again. You would sing it over and over again every time it came on the radio. Man, that was your jam. You would turn up the volume and, and, and you knew it at the back of your palm, right? 
it's, that's how this reminding is. It's, it's sometimes important for us to take the truths that God has put in our hearts and put it on repeat because what occupies your mind can have an influence in your heart. You decide today. You know, in verse number one, he calls them my brothers. He reminds them that they're family. You know, he's, he's writing a letter to them. Today, somebody needs to remind somebody of the goodness of God. Somebody needs to check up on somebody. You need to send an email to somebody. We don't, we don't let, write letters anymore, right? Or maybe you do. If you do, that's, that's amazing. Uh, but I, I haven't received a letter from anybody in a very long time. But we send emails or text messages. But they can be comforting. In times of stress, in times of pain, it's amazing what somebody can, somebody who lifts up their phone sends a text message to somebody saying, hey, I just want to remind you that I'm praying for you. Reminding can be so effectual. Their separation was so destabilizing, it was so violent. And he says, man, you know that our coming was not in vain. And in verse number one, he says, hey, I want to remind you, I, my, our coming, stay strong in the faith because our coming was not in vain. He's saying our presence was not void of content. That's what he's trying to say. My existence actually made a difference. He's reminding them, guys, I just didn't come there and stay for three weeks. I wanted to make sure that my existence was purpose, purposeful. What are the Thessalonicas that God has put you in? What are the Thessalonicas that God is sending you to? It could be your workplace. It could be a place of business. It could be your own family members. It could be a strained relationship. But God is looking at some of y'all and saying, man, does your presence have purpose in every environment that God puts you in? He says, man, I didn't waste my time. I, I, I came with a purpose. I made sure that everything that God sent me to do, I fulfilled. And then I left. He said, man, I, I didn't come there to waste my time. You know, sometimes we don't know why we are where we are. Sometimes we're stuck in a bad job, in a bad relationship. Sometimes we're stuck in a bad situation at work. I, I don't know what your situation is. But have you asked yourself in that situation, have I fulfilled the mission of the Great Commission that God has given me in this situation, in this scenario? Because if you haven't, don't argue with God to take you away from there. Because sometimes God puts you in places and says, man, you might be the light in this dark situation. And unless and until you can look at God and say, God, I've done everything in my capacity to share the gospel, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to do everything to change this environment, don't quit because God's not, quit on you. God's not quitting on you as yet. It's so important for us to remember that. Ask yourself that day after day, have I at least tried? Is my presence making a difference? You know, Paul, even in the midst of conflict, you know, he's saying, man, my, our presence made a difference. Think, think about that for a second. People were out there to get him. People were there to kill him every single day. Crusade after crusade, he would preach from a stage and then go into hiding. He would, he would go away where people wouldn't see him and he would come back and do it over and over again. But man, every time persecution hits us, every time we go through a struggle at, at work or in our families, we want to run away. We want to quit. But, but he's saying, man, I... I, I want to be. I want to make sure my presence is purposeful. I urge you today, church, make sure that your presence is purposeful in every place that God has put you in. The only way you and I can turn this world upside down is not being disappointed because it's upside down, but doing everything in your ability to say, God, as long as you have given me this ability to fulfill the great commission, I want to do everything I can. I want to put my heart and my strength and my soul into making sure that I make a difference to turn the upside down world right side up. And that could be it through your testimony. How is Paul capable of doing this? And the next verse answers that for us. It was through boldness. In verse number two, it says, But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. What is he talking about? He was shamefully treated. If, if you probably know the story in Acts chapter 16, before they, 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 they made exploits and they stepped into Thessalonica, uh, you know, they were preaching in Philippi and this demon-possessed woman was following him everywhere and, and she, was set, she, she was following him and, and Paul goes up, to him, goes up to her, prays for her and she was set free, right? 
And as soon as she was set free, everybody was mad. Others were mad, and, and her, her owners were mad, and they grabbed Paul and his friends, and they were beaten in a public marketplace in the, in the Agora, and, and the paparazzi was there, and, and it went viral on YouTube. They put it on the snap, on the talk, on the, on, the, on the reels, everywhere. His face was plastered. They told him about what he did. Like everybody knew that he was put to shame in Philippi for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he's referring to. It was suffering. It was shameful. And you would think that when someone goes through that, you would re-strategize. You would rethink your message. You would pull back. You would tone it down, right? Any normal person would do that. But check out what Paul says. Paul says, nope, I'm not doing that. I'm not pulling back. I'm not re-strategizing. God has called me with one message. I'm gonna make sure that I'm gonna preach this message. He could have decided that he had a better, he better be careful or more careful to win friends and influence people. He would have probably gone back to the books and read some Dale Carnegie and he would have been like, man, how do I influence people more? How do I shift my, no, 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 nothing of that sort. He didn't play down the gospel. After this terrifying experience, Paul didn't say, no, I'm, I'm gonna change my approach. I'm gonna be more tactful or less outspoken about the gospel. No, he essentially said, man, I am gonna preach the gospel like I've always done because this gospel is life changing. And unless I present this gospel to the upside down world, there's no way that they're gonna be turned right side up. Y'all, your witness is powerful. Your life and my life is powerful. When we stand in the presence of God, God is looking at each one of us and saying, I, I, I want you to live out your Christianity. I want you to be a believer in your workplace, in every place possible, in the Thessalonica that God is sending you to. Are you being a faithful witness of God? You know, it's so beautiful to compare Paul's reality with his response. All right, his, what was his reality? Suffering, right? Shame, conflict, and, and, and the amazing thing is his response to these three things is boldness. What? Like, these three things should make you cower. These three things that you're facing should make you run away. These three things that you're facing should make you go away from this situation. But his response is the boldness. These three things don't produce boldness. It produces insecurity. How then does it produce boldness in Paul? He says, I have boldness in the Lord. Church, I want to remind you something this morning. In every situation that you find yourself in, every helpless situation, remind yourselves over and over again that if God is for me, if God is by my side, if he has given me the ability to stand here, if he has brought me to it, it's not just a cliche. I'm not just saying it to sound good or to tickle your ears. This is the truth of the gospel that if God has called you to it, he will take you through it. He would hold your hand. He will comfort you. He will strengthen in you. He will be with you. He tells you that no matter what storm comes, no matter what waters come, it will not capsize you. It will not drown you because the promise of God is that I am yours and you are mine. If you remain in me, I will remain in you. That's where he gets his boldness. Not let me try to do everything I can. Not let me go and build up my stamina and my boldness. It's the boldness in the Lord. The boldness in the Lord is a different kind of boldness. That's the kind of boldness that makes David stand in front of the lion and say, yo, what's up, bro? That's a different kind of boldness. You, you understand what I'm saying? Boldness inside of you will be like, no matter how strong you are, you'll be like, oh, time to check out, and you run the opposite direction. But boldness in the Lord is looking at a Goliath that stands in front of you, and when everything and everybody is telling you, you have no chance, boldness from the Lord is saying, I still have God on my side. Come on, somebody, you better respond to this, right? And that's what Paul is reminding us today is that I have something that y'all look at and you're like analyzing it and you're looking at it from the world's perspective but y'all, you don't know this Christ that I know. Uh, you, you have not experienced the fullness of this Christ that I know. He says, the boldness in Christ, in the Lord. His boldness was sourced in the inexhaustible. His boldness was the kind of boldness that David had when he said, hey, though I, though, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil. How? Because he is what? With me. I can't say it if, if he wasn't with me. Church, I want to remind you, the only way you're going to have the boldness to turn your world upside down is the knowledge that you're not in it alone. 
Am I talking to somebody here? Don't ever think that when you go and witness, you're doing it on your own. God is with you. He's going to give you the strength. He's going to give you the ability. He's going to give you the tenacity to stand your ground and, and hold on to the ethics that you hold close to your heart, to hold on to the values and the morals that you hold dear to your heart. And even though everything shifts and moves around you, the ability that God gives you to say, I will still stand is not rooted in your ability. It is rooted in the ability that Christ gives in you. Why did he have the boldness? In verse number three, he says, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any other attempt to deceive. He lists three things. He says, you know where my ministry originated from? Let me tell you. You want to know what my basis of ministry is? You know what my mantra of ministry is? Let me give it to you. He says, three things. He says, it does not come from error. It doesn't come from impurity. And it doesn't come from an attempt to deceive. I'm going to try to go quickly through this. Their preaching is not from impure motives such as ambition or pride or greed or popularity. You know, the reason the gospel was was spread as fast as it did back in the day was because people were selfless. These apostles said, not for my glory, not for my limelight, not because I want to build my brand, not because I want to build my Instagram followers, or not because I want to build my my, 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 my Facebook likes and blah, 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 subscribers, and no, 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 none of this. For them, it was one motivation, for God and for his glory. He says, man, I didn't have ambition. I didn't have pride. I didn't have greed. I I had nothing to gain. I had more to lose than I had to gain. You know, he's talking about the many charlatans that would wander around the towns back in the day and they would make their way into the Greek world peddling their religious beliefs or their philosophical nostrums to people and tell them, hey, this is the way you do things. Uh, Many cults that were forming, right? People that were abusing, spiritually abusing people for, for nonsensical things. And these gullible devotees would sit at their feet and they would give them money and they would give their attention and they would give their lives to them. And Paul is differentiating and saying, guys, we are not that those are the people that benefit those are the people that gain it's for their glory but what we're trying to do is not point to us we are trying to point to Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith they're trying to they're trying to drive into the people that it was necessary for Paul and his friends to emphasize the, the purity of their motives and actions by contrast with these other charlatans that he was talking about. He's saying, man, we had boldness because we were not malicious. We didn't have any malicious intent, no perverted motives to exploit you, pure motives. And, and, and those pure motives was their motivation for the gospel to be preached. You know, the the word translated deceit in this word, attempt to deceive or deceit in this word is this idea of baiting a hook. Anybody go fishing here? I love fishing. Anybody else fishing? I have one person, two, two people that do fishing. But everybody understands what baiting a hook is, right? You take a, every time you go fishing, you take a hook and you put a bait on it. It could be a worm. It could be a, uh, something, right? You, you put a bait on it and you throw it in the water with the hopes that a fish would come and bite it. The, the word used over there is exactly that. In other words, Paul is trying to say, man, I, I'm not trying to trap you here. I'm not trying to trap you into knowing Jesus. That's not what I'm trying to do. I don't need to do that. You know, he's not trying to be this clever salesman that traps people into his buying product. Spiritual witnessing and Christian salesmanship are very different. Christian witnessing and, 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 and religious salesmanship are completely different and that's what he wants them to understand is that these are two different things we are not that he says these are two different spectrums altogether and we do not need to explain and in a second I'll explain that to you but and the question arises why was he so bold in this in the middle of this insecurity verse number four it tells us this but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel so we speak not to please man but to please God who tests our hearts. He says, man, God evaluated us. We're not here just out of nowhere. We didn't just, you know, set up shop and start preaching about Jesus. He says, God evaluated us. He entrusted us with this message. 
We preach because we believed. He gripped us. He says, I'm a messenger of God's grace in every room he puts me in. He's like, I'm the same here. When I go to another town, I'm the same. When I go here or here, when I go home, when I sleep, I'm the same. It's not me putting on a mask. I am completely sold out for this gospel is what he's saying. You know, secular literature uses this word deceit uh, in terms of a huckster or, or they use this word for a tavern keeper or in, in today's modern language, a bartender of the ancient world who would water down the wine of a drunk person. If you would see a person that's completely drunk and he has no control over himself, what they would do is they would take his wine, they would pour out a little bit and, and they, would, they would mix water into it to, to, to water it down. That's the word that, 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 that the connotation used over here. You know, there are also spiritual hucklers, those who, huck, hucksters who, who, who water down the word. They, they, they use guile and, and tricks with the message of Jesus Christ. But Paul's like, I don't need to do that, y'all. Like, they need to do that because their message has no substance. He says, but we were approved by God and to be entrusted with the gospel so we speak not to please man but to please God who tests our hearts. This is good stuff. Why didn't he have to prove himself? Why didn't he have to share this gospel in a, in a salesman point of view or, or from, for, you know, try to sell it, try to make people buy into it because he's basically saying, I don't have to do that. Why? Verse number five, for we never came with words of flattery as you know, nor with pretext for greed or God is our witness. He says, God be our witness. We never came to you with flattery. That's what the charlatans would do. They would come to them. They would sweet talk them. They would buy from their business. They would tell them how nice they were, how, how beautiful they were, how, how wonderful of a family they had. They would smooth talk them into buying into their message. And Paul's like, I didn't have to do any of that. A world changer is not fueled by flattery, y'all. You don't need flattery to win somebody for Jesus Christ. When you flatter someone, you really don't care about them. You're praising them to use them. That's what flattery is. And Paul says, I had pure motive. He said, I, I, I was not fueled by bad flattery. Flattery operates under ulterior motives. What does flattery do? Flattery misleads people by making them think that you believe in them more than you do. Am I talking to somebody? Does this make sense? But see, that's not the gospel message. It's an inconvenient truth. This message is an inconvenient truth. It's not a message that you share. It's, it's not a fl flattery message. It's not a message that you look at somebody and say, oh man, this is going to make you feel real good. There's some things in here that you read. No, 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 no. There are things in here that will shock you. There are things in here that you're going to be reading and you're like, does he really want me to follow him? Like Jesus looked at people and said, hey, if you want to follow me, you got to abandon everything. You got to pick up a cross and follow me. Oh man, that sounds enticing, Jesus. Let me just do that. How many people did that? Jesus was like, if you want to follow me, you got to lay down your life. Oh, wow, that's enticing, Jesus. Why not? Let me do that. No, it wasn't flattery. It's not really what tickles your ears. You know, the gospel is far from flattery and coated with, and coated with sugar. And, and he's trying to make them understand this. See, for flattery to work, one devious person needs to convince another gullible person that they are more than what they really are. Am I talking to somebody? But look here for a second, right? The gospel doesn't need the gospel sharer to boost anybody's morale or to flatter them or to increase them, their, their image or to make them look good. The message of Jesus Christ does that. The message of the Bible is life-changing. It tells me that I am created in the image of God. It tells me that he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. It tells me that I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Uh, and Paul's like man I don't need to flatter you I don't need to tickle your ears I don't need to tell you how good you are the word that I'm preaching to you this Jesus that died on the cross of Calvary for your sin and my sin we are all sinners but Jesus died on the cross and that is the message I want to share with you and that's all that people needed is that we were lost but now you are found and all you got to do is ask this Jesus to come into your heart there's somebody watching online today. There's somebody sitting over here today. And you need to ask Jesus to come into your heart, to take residence in your heart, to tell you that, 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 that you were made in the image of God. And you're probably somebody that never made that decision in your life before. And I urge you to make that decision today. I urge you to give your life to Jesus today. 
I urge you today to, to look at God and say, God, you know what? I need, there's this part of me that needs, and, and trust me, there's nothing I can do. There's no f- words of flattery that I can share with you to accept this Jesus. But the Bible itself, if you open this and start reading it, you know, some things are difficult to digest. But you know what? The message of this is incomparable to anything else that you will ever hear because salvation in Jesus is all that you need because when you start there, you have everything. And he finishes off that sentence by saying, God's my witness. He's saying, this is all I preached. One of the reasons that here at Commission we teach from the Bible, we take chapters and books and we just break it down verse after verse is because I don't need to preach from a movie to grow the church. I don't need to preach from a brook to grow the church. The Bible, the Holy Spirit told me, just preach the word. Just preach the word. Just preach the word. Just open the word and teach what's in the word. People will come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. You think you need to go and have an apologetic scourge to share the gospel with somebody? No, like I said this two weeks ago. You think that you need to be trained in Bible school to go and share the gospel effectively with somebody? No, I shared this two weeks ago. All you need is a single message, the message that is so potent, that is so powerful. Jesus came. Jesus Christ came into this world. He died for your sins, and he is coming back soon. And because he died for your sins, you are saved, and you have life in eternal. That's all you need. That's a starting point. He says, God is my witness. He evokes God as the witness to his motives. Wow. Like, how many of us can do that? How many of us can be like, man, I've done everything I've done. I could this today to be the hands and feet of Jesus. God be my witness. Am I talking to somebody? Like, would you feel comfortable with saying, I would like almighty God to vouch for the purity of my motives? <laughs> That's an uphill task if you ask me. I want Almighty God to stand as a witness to everything I did today. He will tell each one of you that I lived my life to the best of my ability with a pure conscience. I didn't cheat anybody today. I didn't lie to anybody today. I didn't deceive anybody today. I didn't go behind anybody's back today. I, didn't, I, didn't, I treated my wife well today. I treated my husband well today. Man, I, I, I blessed my children today. I didn't curse them today. Man, I lifted people around me. I gave them a reason to smile. How many of us at the end of every day can stand in the presence of God and say, God be my witness. I did everything in my capacity to be a witness to Jesus Christ. I can't. But Paul is motivating us today. The only way we're going to flip this upside down world. You know, and that's what we kept telling. In the Garden of Eden, everything was right side up. Sin enters this world and man falls to sin and sin takes this right side world up and looks at the majority of the world that didn't see that right side up world, flips it upside down to make it seem like the upside down was right side up. But the cross of Jesus Christ guarantees you and me that if we know the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul says, man, I can't help. He says it, he says, I can't help myself but take this gospel message and share it with everybody I know. You know, if God was assessing your motives, would you be confident that those results would be pure? pure? My thoughts, my words, my actions. Verse six, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles. What is he saying? He's saying, man, glory. I, I did not seek glory. He's saying, that was not even my intention. Glory, the word glory means applause or fame in the original translation. He says, I wasn't doing what I was doing for fame of myself or to show other people. I wasn't doing this for a show or for, a, for, a, for an audience. Man, this is so convicting in the age of social media, isn't it? Like, I'll do this because this will look good for my image. That's what a lot of people, a lot of us say, right? It, it's toxic when we begin to do things that other people, that you want other people to approve. And you don't even know it, but it becomes so toxic. 
And Paul is saying, I I wasn't seeking an applause. I wasn't seeking a double tap. I wasn't seeking any of that. I wasn't seeking a share or a comment. No, 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 nothing. Applause is not what drove a world changer like Paul. In fact, Jesus looked at every one of his disciples and said, guess what, guys? I'm sending you, but you may actually go to that door, that, that, that house with bricks. It has that door. You might go to that door and you might knock and they might actually look at you, spit on your face and shut the door in your face. What would you do? That's what Jesus said. And he said, go. He didn't give you a reason to go. He said, go. And he, he, he finished that off in saying, if that happens to you, dust your shoes off. Because there's another door. There's another opportunity. It wasn't a man, I want to be approved. I want to be liked by them. I want them to receive me. Trust me, in your quest to turn the world upside, there's this, there's this idea that God gives you and says, don't be disappointed. There are times that you look at one disappointment and everything, your decisions for tomorrow revolve around that disappointment. He says, don't be disappointed about closed doors. There are a hundred more that are open there, a hundred more that will swing open for you. You know, most of us feel that it's our responsibility to establish a reputation there's this great difference between reputation and character, church. Reputation is what people think we are and character is what we actually are. I'm gonna say that one more time. Reputation is what people think we are and character is what we really are. And then he says, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, man, that word demands in Greek means throw a weight. That's literally what it means. It's to throw your weight around. He says, man, I could have had weight or apostolic clout is what he's trying to say. I could have been proud. I could have been, you know, egoistic. I could have come up to you and said, do you know who I am? Like, I am the Paul. Like, like ta-da. Like, like you got to give me a, a, a hotel room to stay in. You, you, you know, you got to treat me like a king because I am the Paul. <laughs> he had that clout. He had that status. He was the apostle of apostles. He had all of that. He could have said, I was appointed by Jesus. I am the apostle. Do you know who I am? Like, I have an important role, he says, but I don't have an ego. Church, you could could be placed in different situations in Thessalonica's in your life that you may have an important role. It could be as a father. It could be as a mother. Every one of us are placed in places of influence. No, Instagram is not what makes you an influencer. Stop and take a second to think about the places of influence that that God has put you in. There are so many, it might be your workplace, you could be a manager to three people or five people or even 50 people. But I'm telling you something, your position that you've been given should not give you reason to be egoistic. Let the light of Jesus Christ shine right through you. Use your position, use your, your status of influence to make sure that everybody around you knows the love of Jesus Christ. Let it never be around about you. You know, the spirit of entitlement. We live in that age, man. Our kids, like, they think they're entitled to it. My daughter came up to me the other day and said, uh, I just finished my food. I need an ice cream. I said, what? I said, what'd you say? She said, I need an ice cream. I said, okay, first, I, I don't think you understand what need really means, so I'll let it go, but you don't need nothing. I'll determine what you need. Sometimes we live in this, you know, this, 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 this culture that the spirit of entitlement has just set in on our hearts and we feel like we're entitled to everything and anything. But Paul says, humility, meekness. He says, I, I could have come with an ego, but no. I could have thrown my weight around, but No. What is it that motivates Paul to change the world upside down? Verse number seven, he says, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, uh, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. Church, I'm, I'm about to close in a few minutes, but Paul was a man of authority, but he always used his authority in love. Those places of authority that God puts you in. I pray that God will use you in and through love. He was driven by compassion. He's like, man, I love people. 
The love of God has landed in my heart. The love of God has taken seat in my heart. And because of that, when God's love is embraced, embraced, it's easily extended. You can easily extend God's love when you have understood God's love. And that's what he's trying to do over here. He says, I'm tethered to you like a nursing mother. Do you know that you cannot be a nursing mother and turn your baby to someone else? The baby must be in your arms next to your heart taking care of. That word, take care of, is this word falpo in Greek, which means to keep warm. It's it's this idea, this connotation of, of a hen going and keeping her eggs warm in order for it to be hatched. Metaphorically, it it means to keep a relationship by showing comfort, by being invested, by staying your ground unless and until the point where you make a difference. You know what a nursing mother does? A nursing mother senses a need. A nursing mother sees a need. She anticipates a need. And not only does she sense and and anticipate, but she also meets those needs. Not because she expects something back. No mother feeds their child and says, hey, I'm feeding you. Uh, I'm expecting something back from you as soon as this feeding is done. Nope. Every mother in this room will probably say, I do it unselfishly. Not expecting anything back. It's only, it's a natural response. That's what a mother's love is. And he's saying, guys, when you handle the gospel, handle it like a mother's love. When you take it to people, when you show the love of Jesus to people, do it like you don't expect anything back. Why, Paul? Paul will tell you because I have, the, the, the source of my love is from this inexhaustible source that when I step out into my world, into my Thessalonica, into my Philippi, I sense the need. I see the need of people around me. You know, so many people that live around us, their source is anxiety. Their source is fear and uncertainty. And because of that, what does that produce? It produces anger and short temper and and, and, and depression and insecurity and violence. God is putting you in those places because he wants you to tell them what your source is. He wants you to replace their source with your source. And your source is Jesus and how you can meet their needs when you understand what they need. The Bible says when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because he saw them as a sheep without a shepherd. And you know what he did? The Bible says, and because he did that, it doesn't say he he made sure that he gave them stuff. He says he taught them the word. You know, there's so much of helplessness in in our world around us. They need us to step up. They need some Christians to step up to the to the plate. Worship team, can you come back on stage? And You know, when you and I see the divorce rates going up, when we see abuse happening around us the way it is, when we see suicide rates among young people going up, what should your response be? You should sense it immediately like a nursing mother and your response should be God's compassion. God's compassion should fill us, y'all. Self-consciousness should go out of the window and compassion should come up. The need to protect self, the need to grow self should step out and compassion should be, should, should be your, your product. Paul is driven by compassion. He was motivated to act. World changers, world flippers need to look for needs and anticipate them and meet them like a mother meets the needs of a nursing child. And so the last verse says this, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. You know, some of you are sitting over here, you're like, man, I'm ready, I'm bold. I I go out, I share the gospel with everybody I meet. And that's amazing. Props to you. For some of y'all, you're not there as yet. You're not as bold. You probably need a little more time to come around doing that. And that's okay. Let me encourage those of you that, that, that's probably in that category. Some of you are probably not some, you know, people that go out there and just share the gospel. Some of you, God is just called to share yourselves. What does that even mean? You know, invite them to the sphere of your relationships. Inviting them to that lunch that you're having with your Christian brothers and your Christian sisters. It could be you opening up your own home to open the warmth of your home to them. 
to know that you have the power to change the world one person at a time. It could just be to stop in the grocery store and say, hey, God is leading me to you and ask me to pray for you. Can I, can I quickly pray for you? And that requires boldness. But Lord, would you stir compassion within me? Because when you have true compassion, that turns into action. True compassion doesn't just stay in your heart. Compassion, true, true compassion will lead you to take action. Pity leads to inaction. Compassion leads to action. So many of us have pity on people around us. But Paul looked at every single person and didn't have pity on them. He looked at every person that was lost, that was far away from God, and his heart was drawn to them. And he said, because I have compassion, it leads me to action and to tell you about a Jesus that loves you. A Jesus that died for your sins. A Jesus that gave his life up for you. Paul outlines his method of evangelism and he tells you, the reason they call me a world flipper is because of this. Is because I'm, I learned to minister despite of hardship and persecution. I learned to minister with pure motives. I learned to minister the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth. I learned to minister God's glory, not mine. I don't draw attention to myself. The true way of evangelism is drawing all the attention to God. He ministered selflessly. He didn't expect anything in return. He said, I give, 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 give. He ministered in humility. He didn't take his position and use it to his advantage. He ministered with care and sacrificial love. And he ministered long and laborious. Would you stand up with me, church? As we look at the truth of this gospel, I want us to take a minute to just reflect on the word today. As I do almost every Sunday, I want to give an opportunity to people around today to ask you today, what is it that you need in your heart? For some of us, it's peace. For some of us, it's comfort. For some of us, it's strength. For some of us, it's stability. For some of us, it's restoration. As we go through this series, I want some of us to be challenged in our witness. I want us to retrospectively ask ourselves, man, what do I need to change about my witness? And for some of us, it's as simple as saying, I just need to make a lifestyle change. Maybe the Thessalonica that God has put me in, I, I, haven't, been, I haven't been the hands and feet of Jesus there. Let me begin there. See, I want to clear this room of, of doubt. I want to let you know what I'm preaching is not you outlandishly just going out there to the park and saying after the service is done and saying, hey, I want to share the gospel with you. If you do that, that's great. I'm not stopping you from doing that. But that's not what I'm trying to communicate this morning. I'm trying to communicate that each one of us have areas in our life that God has strategically put us in. And you might hate it. You might hate your job. You might hate that, the family that you're in. It might be a particular relationship with a family member. And you just can't, you can't stand somebody that comes to your church. I hope there's nobody like that in our church. I hope everybody loves each other. But where has God put you? The, the Thessalonica that God has put you in, can you confidently say that I try every single day to be the hands and feet of Jesus? Not just that but God will be my witness from this day on. Can I challenge you this morning? That's a challenge I want to give you. Let's start with one place. Which place can I identify and say, hey, this is what I need to focus on in my marriage. For some of y'all, y'all need to start in your marriage. For some of y'all, y'all need to start in your job, your relationship with your manager, your, your relationship with your subordinates, your relationship with your colleagues. For some of y'all, it's your children. whatever that, that area of life that you need to retrospectively look at and say, God, 
I need you to heal this area. I need to heal, heal every part of me, of my life, of my existence. Somebody probably praying for healing in this. And like, like, like I said earlier, like we do almost every other week or every week, I, I want to give this opportunity. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I want to let you know, man, you're missing out. The day I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and I asked him to be king of my life was the day that my life was set free. I, I experienced so much joy, so much love, so much of, of God's blessing and, and, and fullness the day I stepped out of darkness and into the glorious light of Jesus Christ. There's probably somebody here today that needs to make that decision. You, this is probably, probably somebody that made that decision a while ago. And it, you probably have been, you, you probably walked far from it. And you're in a different place in your life and you just need to recommit your life to the Lord today. And say, God, I just, I just need to get my life straight, my life right. Like I said, I can't tickle your ears. I don't, I don't need to. This, this is powerful in itself. It's so potent. It's so powerful. And all you need is this for me to share this with you and for you to know that you are loved. And if that's you, I want to pray with you today. If you're sitting in this place and you say, Gee, I want Jesus to come into my heart. I know it's very few of us, but man, I have, to, I have to go back today after I'm done with this service. And tonight when I pray, I got to look at God and say, God, I, I left it all at the altar. There might be 50 people, and I don't know what your backgrounds are, but if there's somebody here that doesn't know Jesus as your Savior, if you haven't asked them to be, be your Lord and Savior, this is your opportunity. If that's you, if you're watching online, comment on our stream and say, hey, I want to make that decision today. If you're sitting right here and you need to make the decision, would you show me your hand so I can pray with you this morning? And, and, and there might be one, it might be zero, it, might, it doesn't matter, but at the end of the day, I have to say, Jesus, I called out and I said to people that they need to give their lives to you. There's somebody that had made the decision to follow Jesus? but you never followed through and said, I want to be a public witness to my test. And, and, and you never got baptized. And you said, you, you never gave your life to Jesus to where you wanted other people to, to see that decision you made in, in being baptized in water. I want you to make that commitment today. Come meet us after the service. We would love to give you information. We have a baptism service coming up. But I'm going to hand it over to the worship team and as they lead us in a few minutes of worship, I ask that we just completely surrender to the Lord. Put all our inhibitions aside and ask God to speak to the very essence of our lives. Do some talking with the Lord this morning and I'll be right back. Thank you for listening. We love bringing you the word on so many different platforms. We are so thankful for what God is doing in and through us. We'd love for you to subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to share this message if it has blessed you.